Irving Juncture. I'm uh, really excited for this conversation. Uh, I wanted to just give you guys a little bit of a sense of our creative incubator, which is the initiative that is running this series. Uh, it's part of the Bronzeville Incubator, which uh, we are currently uh, in, and it is focused on supporting artists, creative entrepreneurs, creative enterprises, and arts organizations in Bronzeville and across the South Side. Please follow us on Instagram and on Facebook if you aren't already. Um, uh, we have three more terrific entrepreneur series panels uh, planned for the next three months, so please check them out. Uh, and I do want to thank the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events Made in Chicago Initiative, which is funding this program, uh, and also thank DJ Lakari for playing uh, the music. <laughs> Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to our host, the TTIN. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Henry, for that the introduction. I'm so happy to see all of you all's faces. I'm so happy to be here in the Bronzeville Incubator today. So not enough thanks can be shared on this space. And these lovely folks inspire me so much. So I'm happy to be here as your host and facilitator for this conversation. Um, and as it states, so we're here today to kick off the Art Entrepreneur Series, try to say it fast, um, and this is the first episode surrounding the business of freelance. Um, real quick before we, we dive in here, um, this is a special place for me. Um, I moved to Chicago almost three years ago, and I was diving into my freelance journey. Um, so I was balancing entrepreneurship and being an artist myself. And this was one of the first places that I, I stepped into and felt kind of like the palpable community feeling, the artistic feeling, um, just the energy surrounding, um, uh, just the, the, the art and the inspiration that I was seeking to achieve. Um, stepping into Chicago, it's a big city, a lot of connections to be made. And when, you're, when you just come in, you kind of feel small. You feel like, I don't know anybody. Where do I go? How do I plug in? And so I actually connected um, with some folks that have been really pivotal to my my um, my growth in Chicago, and I'll get into that a little bit more. But I'm happy to be here again. This space holds a lot of memories for me, so I'm happy to be back. Um, but um, just to give a brief run of show here uh, for the next hour and a half, again we'll be having a conversation regarding art, art and entrepreneurship, and um, we're gonna be. Having a conversation, I'm going to be asking our three panelists questions pertaining to their artistic journey and their experience. And uh, we're going to change up the format a little bit. Um, and well, we're going to enhance the format and say, um, I don't know if you all are familiar with Actors on Actors, but the inspiration behind how we're changing the format slightly is to give us all a converse, uh, give us all a space to have a conversation with one another. So it's not just that I ask you a question and ask you a question. But let's have a conversation with each other because we occupy a, a unique space being artists and entrepreneurs. And I think we can pose questions of one another that kind of help illuminate our unique opportunities and challenges. So that's, that's a little bit of the run of show here a bit. Um, so I'm gonna dive into a little bit of um, an introduction. And um, I'll speak, I'll just introduce myself really quickly here. And because I have a fun prompt for you all okay. um, to, to address it. Okay, so you're ready. Um, so my name is Ititi Ayeni. Uh, I am a Southside-based entrepreneur and uh, metalsmith. So I'm a jeweler actively. I am also a textile artist. So um, so that's just kind of one, one field that I occupy. I also, how I was connected to this space was through an enterprise called Gumbo Media, where I serve as operations director. We are a digital media agency that focuses on amplifying back, black stories um, and helping businesses elevate their branding and their messaging and kind of give them clarity on how they want to best face themselves in the world. So. Straddling two different fences here. I know very well what it takes to help build a startup. And then I'm also in the trenches every day, all my jewelry stuff, um, making it happen. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And I will 
toss it over to you three, but before we do, I want to hear from you um, what your name is, of course, what your area of artistic and entrepreneurial focus is, and how long you've been in the game. Last question to add to that is, what are some of your hyphens? I'll explain. So the word entrepreneurship is a hyphen in and of itself. It's art and entrepreneurship. And even as I was speaking just now, I was relaying, you know, I'm a metalsmith, I'm an operations director, I have other things that are added to my intro. So I'm an auntie, I'm an avid thrifter, I'm a cat mom, and so all those things are really important to me as hyphens that I wear. So what are y'all's hyphens as well? So whoever wants to dive in first, the floor is all yours. Yes, yeah, thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Akisha Lockhart. Thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. This is an honor. I feel like I'm more of a student. So just to be up here, I'm like, should I be? I should be over there. I'm so not saying anything. Yes, you all, because you all are great too. And uh, but I just feel like I, I'm humbled by even being invited to, to be here. So thank you all. Um, so my high things first off is I'm a child of God, which is most important. And um, that is the overall title. Under that umbrella falls, I am a storyteller. So I, my vehicles to tell stories are through my journalism degree, which I interview celebrities. That's my love and passion. The reason why I choose to do that is because I feel like oftentimes we never know the backstory, the sweat equity that was put in for these people that we, a lot of us admire and look up to. And I'm very happy that God has put me in a position where I can be that bridge to talk to a lot of people that other people want to talk to. And my focus when interviewing them is to find out how they got to where they are. So more of the dream, and again, the grind and the, the beautiful struggle. So that's one of the hyphens is interviewing celebrities. The other hyphen is I'm a photographer. So I also tell stories through photography. And that has been a beautiful journey for me because it was somewhat of a surprise. It's something that I've always done, but then it turned into a whole other thing. We get that later. And then the last thing for now, just to keep short because they're alive, um, I am a brand influencer. So I tell stories for companies. So one of the part people that I partner with now, just for example, is Nike Chicago. And so I help them tell their story through different ways of doing that. So the three things would be, again, um, celebrity interviewer, photographer, and brand influencer, and all of them really, I think, um, complement each other, and they all make sense as far as just being a journalist, and again, not only telling my story, but helping others tell theirs. And was that all the questions that you had? Because I know it was like, oh, no, I mean, I'm trying like, to make say sure your, that. Say your name, <laughs> say your hyphen. And oh, yeah, how long, how, how long have you been at it? Okay. I honestly feel like I came out the womb, like, and I was just in it. That's how I feel. I don't, I don't really know because even as a child, um, my sister's here, shout out to my sister, Regina over there, um, who I love very much and she's been a big supporter. But I think she can say of me and my family, since, since I was a child, I was doing pretend interviews in the kitchen. Like, oh, I'm a, I'm a host, I'm gonna be like Oprah and you're gonna be my, so to me, I, didn't, I don't know anything else but this. So I feel like I've been doing this since the beginning. Born and bred, organic. Yes. Thank you for Thank that. You. <laughs> um, yeah, so. Word. First of all, Akisha's awesome. She's being super humble right Thank now. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. So my name, you're welcome. My name is uh, Eddie Precise Lamar. I am a native Chicagoan from the south side of Chicago, Roseland area. Shout out Wild Hunters, Wild Wild. Hey. Um, I am my hyphens. So I'm a dad nice. of three sons. Um, I'm a son, uh, I'm also a writer, a photographer, and a motivational speaker. And right now I'm sharing my fitness journey on Instagram, so I don't know what you would call that, uh, but I'm that guy. Motivational. Right, motivational. So um, I'm just really excited about being here. I'm excited about sharing and learning, and I'm excited to share this microphone right now. It's a pleasure to meet everybody. Word. <laughs> uh, is this on? Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, it's such, it is such a pleasure to be here. And, you know, big thank you to Bernard Lloyd for his vision and for his leadership and, and all that's happening around this, this area. I just, um, I'm just so inspired by the incubator and box vehicle and community. Um, no. Oh, yeah, introduce yourself. Oh, yeah. Sure. Stop right there. Yes. Rewind. Okay. okay. So, my name is Dorian Sylvain. Um, I'm a, uh, an artist, a muralist. Uh, I think of myself most fundamentally as a painter uh, when it comes to my working happens, I guess. Um, I'm most fundamentally, though, a mom. I'm a mother of three boys, mm -hmm. special journey. <laughs> um, and I have uh, spent four decades, over four decades now, in the business as an artist. I uh, started in my early 20s, probably 18 even, I started to claim myself as an artist. And um, I have been pursuing it ever since. I um, not only work as a painter, um, I've had a couple of different evolutions in my career. For um, many years, I was designing scenery for community theaters on the South Side. Um, I always referred to my boys as backstage babies because I, I was that kind of mom who had the Jerry Carrier and the portable crib and took my kids with me while I worked. Um, kind of evolved from that after number three was born, it became a little cumbersome trying to do the theater thing. Anybody who's worked in theater, particularly on the tech side, knows that it's very evening heavy. So for about 20 years, I shifted my skill set to work in residential environments in which I was just being commissioned doing um, uh, private murals or color layouts or curating people's art collections or I don't know, I just kind of make a path for the past 20 years and now as my kids are all in their 20s, um, they actually work for me and we're kind of back out of the public sphere uh, doing public murals again. So um, when I think of myself even as a mom, I think that that spills over into so much that I do even as an arts educator. Um, it's that, that idea of caring, that idea of sharing the information, that idea of trying to nurture um, this next generation to become artists. Um, as a mom, I have seen, well actually just I should say, I have seen the removal of the arts from the schools over these last few decades, and it's really disheartening. Um, so as an artist, I really feel as an muralist, that I'm just part of myself as a what I call an artist citizen. And the generation of artists that I grew up under were instrumental in the black arts movement. So the Oscar Brown Juniors, the Margaret Burroughs, mm -hmm. the um, Alvin Joan Brown. I mean, these are, are black artists who are also institution builders. And so that's kind of the school that I came from. So when I think of myself as an educator, it's not just from the standpoint of keeping kids busy, but it's really about trying to um, share that culture and pass it on to the next generation. Um, and then one more thing I wanted to say to you in terms of my practice holistically, I don't know when it happened, but I think as a young child, my mother used to take us a lot of plays and escapades and all that stuff. And it was always the scenery that has to do that so my attention. And so the idea of space has just been a love of mine for many, many decades. Um, the idea of how we treat walls, how we you know, always be in a private space. You know, I'm just really fascinated by how these walls around us can communicate feelings and can express intent in terms of space, and so um, I have just found many iterations of that, not only from set design, but as a muralist, as a artist who works in private homes, uh, as a studio artist. Um, it's to me, it all reports down to try to make space into something inspired. Um, and as a painter, I look toward color as my first level of inspiration. And then from there, of course, you got texture. Oh. Um, 
Thank you so much, Dorian. Actually, um, one thing I wanted to interject, but I didn't say, was help me come curate my space. Thank you. <laughs> that's that's one, but you know, I, I'll refrain. But um, you mentioned space, so creating space, analyzing space, how it's utilized, how it's how it's used to bring people in or potentially you know keep people out. So that's a big part of you know the conversation around space. But I wanted to see how space kind of, you're in communion with space in your own lives. So I asked you all what your hyphens were because I imagine just balancing the two things, artist and entrepreneur is already kind of a juggling act. So based on the other things that you all listed, you mentioned photography, you mentioned brand, um, being a brand ambassador, how do you all make space? How do you all delegate your energy and your time towards all of the different endeavors that you are, you know, currently undergoing? That's an interesting question. Uh, and one other hyphen that I forgot to mention is that I'm an MC. Yes. Just so you guys know that. That's a rapper, if you don't know the term MC. But, um, we like it, we like yeah, it. Okay. So I think it's more or less just kind of, Akisha mentioned coming out the womb doing it, right? So it's kind of like opening up your eyes and then you are in that space. So these days, I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning after I say my prayers, of course, I might grab my phone or I might grab my laptop and then my day starts, right? So that day can, be, that day consi can consist of uh, editing some interviews that I've done, um, maybe writing a song or maybe creating... Um, or maybe just trying to find some inspiration for the word I'm gonna share for the day. And I think that's just a part of, that's just a part of the experience. I don't know if, if there are times where I deliberately set space, maybe if I take a trip down, down to 39th Street, Oakwood Beach, you know, and maybe uh, meditate there and chill for a moment there, maybe create some space there. But in terms of actually being extremely deliberate about it, I think it's just a part of waking up in the morning for me. Yeah. I think for me, I agree with precise on that. It's very organic. I too wake up in the morning and I've been doing trying to do a better job or doing a better job, not trying doing a better job of saying my prayers and listening to something in the word just so that I have my daily break. So I have something to meditate on throughout the day because you get thrown so many different things. So I try to get in a place of peace. Shortly after that, I'm a runner. So I like to go run, that clears my head. And it just gives me that, it gives me just what I need, it fuels me. So I've noticed something that's been really cool with me that like, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. Yeah. But I don't know if you all have ever heard, Pharrell has um, one of his songs, he's like, I see sound. Like yes. he can see sound. And I'm like, I now can see photos. Like I'll be out and I'll be doing something and I'm like, Man, that's like with my eyes. Like, such a dope photo. I don't have like I try to keep that thing on me. I try to keep like I don't have my, my I mean I have a I have my cell phone, so I technically have a camera, but my actual camera, my professional camera, I don't have it on me right now. But sometimes I'll be doing something. I'm just like, look at those kids. Like, and then it's it, it's kind of it's like, man, even if I have my camera, I wouldn't want them to stop. Like I, I don't want because people see a camera and then they, you know, now they're not gonna be natural. So for me, I see photos now. Oh, that that would be such a pretty photo. So it's it just it happens, and then there's scheduling. So space could be I have a planner and I have boxes where okay I'm shooting Jay Ellis event tonight, so I am already prepared in my mind to do that. And I think the biggest thing that helps me is just preparation and having space because I know I can't I can't remember it all. I can't. Technically, I, I need structure in that way of writing things down, of having a to-do list. So the space of like knowing that this is something that helps me be a mess for myself and a client or whoever I'm working with, and just you know, organize. Organization's a big important space for me to do what I do, but it naturally kind of has just become a part of my life. It's like just this dance um, continuously, in, which I love. Yeah, I would say for me, it is, it's been about being fluid. Um, single mom, three kids, freelancing. It's a lot. 
thank God for my mother. <laughs> you know? But it was always about trying to be fluid. Okay, I got, uh, I find myself with three children now. Theater is not working so well anymore. It's a big hustle. I got three kids that you drag around, right? Uh, so then I think, well, then how can I use these skills that I have to still earn money? Because the last thing I wanted to do is get a job. And and I don't mean that for all the obvious reasons, but but also just in terms of having control of my life as a single mom. Maybe I want to go to the Brookfield Zoo with my kid on Friday. You know, um, if I have a job job, I can't, I can't pivot it like that. So it was really important for me to maintain some independence so that I could be the type of mother I wanted to be. And based on that, it dictated certain other options, uh, such as, well, you could go work in people's homes, you know, during the day, you drop the kids off at nine, you run to your house, you're working on a kid's room on a mural, Got to leave it too. Got to go pick up my kids. Client understands. I can go be the, the mom. And so that was really just a long, long time. Uh, my kids are now in their 20s. But it was a matter of assessing my skill set, figuring out what markets of people or relationships that I could apply those skill sets, and um, how I could just keep it moving. So even now, again, you know, my boys are in their 20s. I was able to pivot again. You know, I didn't have to do so much residential, you know, work. I could get back out in the, the field, do larger scale pieces and blah, blah, blah. So for me, it's just always been important to be fluid because on the average day, I'm juggling six projects and, and my kids to some degree. Um, and so it, for, so for me, morning is like the time to center. Uh, to-do lists all the time, always making to-do lists, always checking in on deadlines, you know, deadlines really drive a lot of my momentum, you know, um, but it is in the morning for me, I hate when the kids wake up early, I still have two kids living at home with me, but um, I really need that time to center and to be intentional. Um, Throughout the whole night, the, whatever project I have going on is going through my head the whole night. What do I need? I got to stop and do this. I got to call Regina, order some things. I got to get up. <laughs> you know, so, so in the morning, it's time for my, my mind to kind of rest. And actually, this is what the day is going to look like. Um, but I've had to pivot a lot over these four decades. And, and I'm okay with it. You know, I've become a master at pivoting. <laughs> Master Pivoter. Um, so I, I definitely have some follow-up questions just regarding pivoting for all of you, because I imagine at any point in time, even just to leap into what it is that you're doing now, there was some it necessitated, necessitated probably some kind of realignment or, or pivoting or restructuring. Um, but I also feel compelled to ask about how you all center and, and find your intentions or, you know, find that baseline that you need to feel centered in what you're doing for the rest of you know your day or for your short-term goals or your long-term goals. So what are, if, if, if they exist for you all, mantras or things that you tell yourself in the morning that helps you to feel firm in the intentions that you set? I, uh, Go ahead, yes. No, you got something on your mind. I like to eat, right? Yes. A lot of people, my sister knows this, but I can't throw down. And in order for me to eat, I have to work, right? Mm -hmm. So you only eat what you kill, saying, you know, not literally doing that, but you know what I'm saying. So for me, I'm a full-time entrepreneur now. And my mentality has, has been of that, like now, if you're laying around not doing, if you're not making that call, if you're not sending that email, if you're not checking in on people, okay, like, how are you going to pay these bills? Like, how are you going to get this gas? How are you going to do, how are you going to live the life that you want to live? And then how are you going to help your family? So for me, it's a thing where that is my driving force. I know that it's not to be famous. It's not to be, I mean, super like rich. It's not that I want to be rich in the fact that I have peace when I go home. I want to be rich in the fact that my parents are taken care of. I want to be rich in the fact my sister has that Bentley that I'm supposed to be buying her. Um, and then I'm supposed to be taking care of our dogs. And I'm supposed to be, my nephews, I want them to go to the school of their dream. Like, 
richness for me is like my people are good. You know, like I'm the plug for my family, not in a way where, you know, give me, give me, but like it's the least I can do, you know? And then for other people outside of my family, I want to be able to help them. That's where my richness would come in because you can't take any of this stuff with you. The stuff I'm wearing, I mean, none of this is going to go with me when I get in that box or whatever that thing happens after I'm gone. So for me, it's about legacy and my last name is my legacy. And so as long as my family's good and then anybody else that has come in counter, in, you know, with me, like that is my motivation. So the pictures, the work that I do is important and I take it so seriously. Like Erica Badu said, you know, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my, like I am. I am because it's a reflection of me, which is then a reflection of my parents. When you see me right now, you see Reginald and Janie Lockhart right now who are still married after knowing each other 14, 15, 16 years old, 40 plus, like I am a gumbo of my family. So that is what motivates me to when I don't feel like doing it, you know, it's like, okay, I go watch a little sex in the city, have a laugh. You know, I smoke a cigar, I like smoking cigars. I go for a run, I do that. I eat something good. And then it's like, it's back to the grind, like, because your family is dependent upon it. And they don't put that pressure on me either. By any, like, nobody is putting that pressure on me. Like, you have to go out here and do this because we, like, no, they don't do that. And I think that makes me want it more for them because nobody is pressuring me to do anything but just live in my dreams and my truth. Word. Word, 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 word again. You know, <laughs> no, thank you. When, when you talk about the, uh, the centering aspect of it, so, I started this um, this fitness journey a year ago, and we created a crew called a tribe called a tribe called Fit, right? So every day I'll do my workout. So that's one of the ways that I'll get centered. I'll do my workout, and then I'll record a message for the day. And the way that I end that message with respect to a mantra is to stay focused, positive, and productive. That's how I ended every day. So that's kind of like a jump off point for me. Once I record that message and then I'm in, in the world, you know, making things happen, whatever that is for the day, right? But I, but I know that at the start of the day, the routine is the same. I think it really just comes down to routine, being steeped in, in that routine in some shape or fashion. I know we talk about creating space and I think it starts with just that foundation. And once you have that, you know, you have that solid foundation and you can go spread your wings out into the world and fly, right? Consistency. Right, right. That consistency, right. Just continuing to do that and just knowing that there's something that you do all the time, that you have to do all the time, that gets you going. I don't know if that makes any sense to yeah, you. Yeah, it does. It yeah. definitely makes sense. And yeah. congratulations on your fitness journey, by the way. Thank I you love so you. much. Yeah. Thank I, love you. I can tell you're MC with the name, the plan works. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, mantra is one thing leads to another. Um, Speaking as the, uh, well, coming from a different generation, I'm about to age myself here, but <laughs> I didn't go, I didn't, my, my journey as an artist didn't have the internet and social media. And so much of my success or various projects that I've ended up having kind of came through word of mouth, you know? Um, and so one thing I always tell young artists Again, this idea of one thing always leads to another, meaning that you take every project seriously. Um, I, I have a bad habit of saying yes all the time because, again, generational, you just don't turn down, right? You just, yes, I can do it. I'm going to take it. I'm a freelancer, so I need to keep, yeah. you know, cash flow. Yes. But, but it's not from an attitude of slap dash, you know, let's hit it or quit it. It's always that attitude of I'm going into it 150% because I don't know who's looking at this. I don't know who's talking about this. I don't know um, how this might inspire the next project. So whenever I'm working, I'm always working as though it's the only project and I give it my all because I know it's gonna open up doors to other opportunities. And so when I look at the longevity that I've had over 40 years out here working as an artist, um, it, to me, it's because of that attitude of um, high integrity, you know, and that high integrity shows in your work 
Um, I've mentioned that for a few decades, I was doing residential stuff. And there have been, there's been more than many, uh, more than a few opportunities in which I've had to go back into the house, you know, maybe, I don't know, whatever reason, and maybe 20 years, some of these kids love their murals so much, they're still up. And the first thing I do when I walk in, I think, oh my God, I did this 20 years ago, I bet it looks like shit, you know? <laughs> and I walk in and I inspect my own work and think, oh, you did a nice job, you know? And it feels good, yeah, yeah. to be able, to say that you know um, my work has longevity because I approach it in a matter of uh, I approach it with just very high integrity. I, I um, always um, details mean a lot to me, you know. So I always want to go back and make sure details are correct. But my work is my business card, you know, and that's the way I kind of approach a lot of projects. Um, you know, to this day, still always looking for more work. I mean, at my age, I always say no. For work. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I definitely heard some key words, integrity, legacy. Um, and so those are things that resonate as it relates to just how you all set intention, how you all stay grounded in the work. Um, and But I also heard, to some degree, your process, kind of your day-to-day, -day, and um, things that help you stay organized, your to-do list, your checklist and things. And so to me, that's um, definitely, well, don't want to tell myself as an artist. You know, I try to have to-do lists for my art, but we're still working on that. Um, but y'all have systems that you all spoke to, um, which to me lends itself towards more of the entrepreneurship side um, and or the freelance side, if you will. So um, to that end, what are some things that you've learned formally or informally as it relates to building your businesses, building your systems so that you can have the artistic and creative growth that you want to achieve. One of the things I learned, uh, just one thing I want to mention, I'm also uh, the city manager for Rolling Out. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Rolling Out, uh, the publication. And they do a, um, a seminar called, called Ride every year. And one year when I think it was, I think it was 2017 and Ryan Leslie was the keynote. He was the keynote speaker. Um, and he mentioned operating with a sense of urgency, right? So when he mentioned that, what he means is, let's say somebody gives you their phone number, you know, you know how you hobnob and you're meeting people like, give me your car, yeah, I'll call you, you know, I'll call you, this, this, that, that kind of thing. The idea behind that and what, what I've learned and what actually works for me is that when somebody gives me their number, I call them right away, right? I'm not waiting for this situation, you know, for them to forget about who I am and all these things. And what I've found is that people are way more responsive that way. So operating with a sense of urgency, really moving with intention is what creates more opportunities for me and gets me in front of a lot more people. I have learned that I'd rather pay somebody to write a grant than to write it myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really, I have, through my entire career, I, I have struggled with the requirements that the business side demands to run a successful business. And it is so frustrating that I, I spend so much time now in front of the computer and less time actually painting that it just makes me crazy. And so um, the, the thing that I continue to relearn, honestly, very seriously, is just, you need a team. I, I just can't do it all. And I've been fortunate to find um, some young people who are able to step in and, and do some of the things that, such as grant writing, that is my least favorite writing surveys and responses and reflections and all these things that come with grant money, you know? Um, but it is about that teamwork and being able to delegate, you know? Um, I used to be a one-man band for a long, long time. And I always find it funny. Um, I keep talking a lot about my boys tonight, sorry. But uh, <laughs> I always find it funny when I've had uh, opportunities, for example, to go back into a house and maybe we had to redo a staircase, you know, go finish or something. And the clients, they always tell my boys, you have no idea how hard your mom used to work, you know, because she would just come in on her own and do it. Now I embrace the team. So, uh, yes, those are the things I've learned. 
that worked for me. <laughs> That's something that I'm learning now. A lot of the sayings that I can I can remember hearing, like when I was in high school or younger, they actually like hold hold their value even now. For instance, guilty by association. Well, I have learned as an entrepreneur that a lot of times people, if they see you are associated, they see you with somebody, they will automatically, and this has worked as a blessing for me. I, I, I'm so fortunate to have people in my life, associates, friends, friends turn into family that are out here about their business and their names carry a lot of weight. Like people have a lot of respect for them. So even though I grind to, you know, hold my own with my own name, Keisha Lockhart, AKA she's got a show on Instagram if you'd like to follow me hey. and check out my work. But, and I, I thank God for allowing me to build my own name. But at the same time, if I'm with someone else that has that weight, then I've noticed that people are like, oh, you're cool with such and such. Like they don't even really have to know what kind of person I am, but because we always see you or we've seen you with that person, we know how they move. They only have a certain caliber of person around them. So you must be legit. So, I mean, you're just good off of like the fact that you're just around that person. And I have had so much success in just being like, oh, like, such and such, oh, you're cool with, like, you're cool, like, you're, it's, you're good. So that to me has been a blessing, but then I don't take that for granted. So then once that connection is made, then, you know, my work has to speak for itself now because now I want that referral. I need, I want to keep that and I want to, I want my name to mean something. And yeah, that person that I was associated with, yes, they do. They are, you know, that person but now like as an individual. So word of mouth is really, really big. And even though, you know, we do have social media and everything, but it's extremely important. Like there's nothing like a referral. Like I worked with her and like, you need to reach out to her because not only does she have great work, but she's gonna be, she's gonna be there on time before she's supposed to be there. I mean, she has a great attitude and just having that, you know, someone else speak in your behalf in that way, it means so much. But yeah, you're definitely guilty by association. Like, watch you, you hang out with like, like you, just, like your parents would say as a kid, because literally it can open or close doors very, very fast. And I don't think I've had to experience it on the opposite end. Thank God. Well, that's a mantra that rings true. I think um, it's always just putting your best foot forward, um, because I think in some cases when people see the work that I do, it looks much bigger than it is. It's like, I'm a solopreneur, actually. It's just me doing the photography, doing everything. So I definitely hear that the connections that you have can really speak more volumes um, and help Wait, you. I'm sorry, but something that I heard, too, um, and maybe all you all have, too, sorry, but your network is your net worth. Like, yes. I do believe that is true. I definitely believe that your network is your currency. And, I mean, it, it's not just the money. It's like... Yeah, it's it's major. So I just sorry, I just wanted. To add. Oh no, thank you for that. And it actually makes me question um, in, terms of, in terms of accessibility to networks, certain networks. You know, um, some folks may not be as able or um, might not have the exact same pathways other people have to access certain networks. Um, and so I think that's I'm definitely curious to know how you all utilize your networks or how you all utilize any of the pathways available to you all to generate more, to, 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 to bolster your client base. To make sure you mentioned Dorian cash, cash, and then immediately I thought cash flow. Okay, so that's one of those entrepreneurial, those, that's one of those words that freelancers should know to sustain themselves, um, but that requires, like you're speaking about, knowing people and having the connections and also having, the, those connections can garner you a lot more opportunity based on the sway they hold. So um, just to keep the question short, how do you all kind of create those continued relationships that generate opportunities for you all financially to sustain your, your, your enterprises? Well, before 2020, well, 2020, we used to go outside. <laughs> we used to go to parties and clubs and 
all kind of things, festivals and all of these things. And uh, really, that's how I, I built my network and just meeting people and, you know, going to different places. However, then something happened, right? This thing happened and it shut us all down. And, and I, I call it the year of the pivot. Pivot is the word, right? So in, in these instances, I think, I think stronger relationships were built in the last two years than ever before. I don't know if anybody else feels that way. And I think it's because we had to do it. So in passing, like, I might see somebody outside, but like, hey, yo, hit me up, whatever, you know, and outside, right? But now if we're communicating through email and we're looking to accomplish something that's more intentional and it has more meaning, and we're creating something bigger, right? Because now we are moving with a greater spirit. I, that's just how I feel about it, right? So in, in building these networks, I think, again, within these past two years, I think it's been more of a focus on creating something sustainable, really adding and building to the legacy like you mentioned, because we, we're here one second and we're gone the next. So what ways are we truly impacting, impacting this world? You said 20 years, like you go into a home and 20 years later, you're still looking at a mural that you put in somebody's house. That's amazing. amazing. Truly. That, speaks, that speaks to a, a, something that's bigger than all of us because it, it all encompasses this energy that we're putting out here. And if it's good energy, people are going to want to come back to it, right? And they're going to want you to share it. So I think that's I think that, that's how the network builds based on the integrity of your work and not integrity from a perspective of honesty, but the integrity of, let's say, a post that keeps these, you know, the ceiling up, like maintaining that integrity so that when we show up, we show up the right way and we have something good to offer. You know, for me, too, it's about thinking of deeper institutions that mean much to me. So when I think, for example, of Southside Community Arts Center, I think about the High Park Arts Center. These are spaces that I've considered my creative homes. A um, lot of networking goes on um, at events, as we all know. But for me, it's also important to volunteer time. It's important to give more to the institutions to help sustain and fortify them. And so part of my mission is making sure that these places, at least as, as much as I can, you know, that these places also have longevity and are able to serve the next generation. So, um, I always say I have more time than money, but I don't have a lot of time either. So when I donate time, you know, to these institutions, it's because I care so deeply about them. You know, I serve on the board with the Chicago Public Arts Group. Um, and I just try to be available because it takes a lot to run these institutions. And all of us have seen institutions come and go. And so part of my mission is to make sure that there's some sustainability. My, my mom has a saying that I absolutely love, and she says, it's nice to be nice. And really, it is. It's nice to be nice. So for my relationships, I don't go into it like looking at that person like a dollar sign. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps the situation out very much. So like, I'm going into this relationship. You know, how can I bring something to the table? How can they bring whatever or however that works? But I think some of my most... Uh, lucrative, I guess you want to say it, well, it, it ended up being down the road or whatever. It wasn't based off of, I am trying to get that. That's what I saw in you. It was very just, there was an energy that brought us together. There was a common reason. Maybe I did something for you. Then you saw my work and then that got turned into now I'm getting work or that person did something nice for me. And so for me, I think don't go into anything looking at it like what am i going to get from you financially because it's going to show probably too like i mean that energy people aren't chicagoans aren't stupid like people aren't people aren't hustlers aren't like people can see through that but when they can see you're genuinely just trying to be a good person or trying to lend your artistry to them i think then they'll be like you know that shows them oh okay cool like you're someone i want to build with so I think people just don't get that out of your mind. Like, don't look at people like that. 
it's not cool. It's I nice to be nice. I love that you said uh, what you're bringing to the situation, right? Because it is about what you can provide, not what somebody is giving to you all the time. So yeah, kudos to you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that speaks to, I mean, you're offering mindsets that freelancers can adopt for themselves to, you know, maybe adapt to, the, to their needs or the personal styles, but things that can help them foster longevity, success, um, underscore their integrity and their intentionality. Um, so besides mindsets, so are there, what resources or tools can you all offer that have helped you um, see success in your own fields? Uh, my, my iPhone calendar. Okay. I just got a new iPhone. Hello. <laughs> right. And my, and my task, the task thing. What yes, you call indeed. It? The task reminder. Or checklists. Yeah, that thing. Because yeah. mm -hmm. before, yo, there was so much going on, I'll forget about stuff. And I'm not the kind of guy who walks around with a, a, a planner because I'm not looking at it. I might write it down and then. I lose my pencil. Right. I just, like, I'll write it down and then when I go to Walgreens again, I say, hey, that's a cool planner and I'll grab that one. And then I have all these planners with a bunch of stuff I forgot, right? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, the phone, because the phone is always in our hands, that has been the greatest tool for me thus far. And yeah, I think that works out best. Technology has allowed us to just accelerate so quickly that it allows us to accomplish so many things and it's important for us to be responsible with the technology so that we can stay on task and actually create what we're here to create i'm kind of old school i have a date book that I <laughs> and i got a pack of highlighters that i color <laughs> But I am adapting to my Google Calendar, which has really good, been a good, blessing. Good. So I'm getting there. Good, good, good. Oh, and a whiteboard. I have a whiteboard that works wonders for me too. So just kind of getting up and seeing what's going on. And then it is so pleasing to cross something off your whiteboard. I highly recommend it. It is. It's like it's a high. You know, you get something done, and it's like, yeah, there we go. Until you gotta add something else to it. So you know, yeah. it's a dance. It is. <laughs> I do both those things. I don't I don't like the phone. I don't do the phone so much and the calendar in there, but I do agree my phone is a huge help. Um, I do, like I said, I have a planner. I like writing down, I like crossing things off. But something else that I've added to all these to the to those things, um, I went into someone's office and I thought it was so cool. They have uh, these giant post-it notes, which I like post-it notes. I normally, I mean, I would have little ones, but now I have those big ones and I put them on the wall in my office and I write like the month and like all like dates and like projects I have. And so they're huge post-it. Have you all seen those before? Yep. And so I put them on the wall. So when I'm in my office, I can look up at there and I can see like, oh, like either you have a lot going on or you don't have enough going on this month and it's kind of just that reality check where it's like it's not in a book where i can close it and put it away like my planner it's not my phone where there's so much going on that you know i'm not looking at that but when it's on the wall written on the wall and i have to look that direction and then i can cross it off like you are saying or whatever it is such a it's, it feels great so either i know i'm not getting to the bag enough because i can see it or like oh like yeah, you, you're kind of you're kind of getting to the bag as much, you know what I mean, or whatever. So, and then adding to it and stuff. So that's something that I think is really cool. And they come in different colors. You can get them from like Office Depot or Office Net, something like that. I think that's really dope and fun. I got a shout out to to the to the, uh, the zipping envelope. So, because every project that I work on has a a zip folder, so I can keep my paper mm -hmm. <laughs> and it sketches, drawings, references, and then I lay the folders out on the desk so I can see the title of each project. So those probably keep me more organized even in my calendar sometimes. Mm -hmm. well, well, no, that's good. I mean, the immediate digital tool that I'm thinking for that, for inspiration is Pinterest. I'm on Pinterest all the time. And then I link it to, you know, if I have a meeting, I'll link it to the meeting so my client can see it. So it's just all the different integrative tools that we can use. But it sounds like you all, you know, you're looking for ways to organize your time, organize your ideas, see where your priorities are lie and how that relates to your income um so i have another nerdy question but i'm actually going to pause there because i want to open up the floor to the audience hi audience they look lovely 
Um, so we're about at the hour mark, and so um, I wanted to kind of open up the floor, like I mentioned, kind of give you all a chance to ask questions of each other that you that have um, surfaced for you all during this conversation, but also offer to um, offer it up to the audience. And so um, a microphone will float around. If you have any questions that you'd like to post to the group, um, and then also I want to acknowledge the folks on the live stream. So if there's any uh, virtual questions that have come come through, we'd love to to lend the floor to those questions as well. Is it working? Okay, great. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks so much. I feel like the, the gems that you guys have dropped. Your cup fell over. I don't know if there's anything in it. Just... It's not, but I appreciate okay. you though. I got like, you. Mm, do I in the space. Her? Yeah. In the space. 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 <laughs> um, I, I like, I always feel like God places me at, at particular p places for a reason. And I'm so glad that like Henry and Ryder and I came because I could definitely have some gems. But because you guys are all creatives, my question is, I'm a filmmaker. I just opened, well, actually a month six now, so it's not like just, but. Come on, um, <laughs> come on. Thank you. Um, so I'm the owner of Taylor Lane Creative, and um, I will say that what I'm struggling with as an entrepreneur is when I was working for ad agencies as a storyteller, um, I would tell them, like, you know, I only had, like, one project at a time, but now I'm back. So I have, like you said, you do like average of six projects a day. I'm kind of on that lane. And my process is sometimes like I get into the zone, I'll say. And I feel like every creative person knows what that is. Like you're just like focused and in. It's like you get inspiration. And I'm sure for like as a muralist, you're there. So my question to you and to everyone else is, when you have like six projects a day and I time block, I live off a block schedule. So like how do you decide 30 more minutes in the zone before we move to the next project. Or like, no, actually it's time to move to the next project regardless of the creative flow. Like, what do you, got? like, how do you move from there and then still be authentic to your craft, still be authentic to like the work, you know, that you love to do? That's my question. I, I was gonna say for me, it's all about deadlines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree. I, I hit the deadline and I work backwards. And um, that really drives me because if it was just about me managing my time, mm -hmm. I'm afraid to say that mm -hmm. it wouldn't be that uh, it wouldn't be as organized as it is when I have deadlines driving it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I feel like in your situation, you just have to going back to being super organized and knowing like what is due when, and that is what it has to be the priority right there. If you have you know, two or three things that essentially have the same exact deadline. Now that, that could be, you know, nerve wracking, but at the same time, it's like, okay, well, this is the one I'm going to start with. Maybe you start with the one that maybe you think has the least amount of, and I don't mean like work, but you know what I mean? Like that you may have to put less of yourself into, but not, you're putting your whole self into it, obviously. And then kind of knock that thing out so you can cross, so you can get that gratification of crossing that off. I got that done. And now as the task calls for more of you to more of your time, and if they're all at the same time a due date, then kind of work like that. So that would be my recommendation is writing it down, knowing what each thing entails and like, okay, this I know I can definitely knock out first. Let me focus on this, then take a break, go for a walk or something, um, eat something, like I said, watch an episode of something. Like, just take a break from it, like decompress and don't beat yourself up about that. Like, don't back to back to back. I gotta knock all this, I mean, you're gonna drive yourself crazy. Like, go play with your child, go play with your dog, go do something, give yourself 30 minutes, come back, okay, reset. Now, what do I need to do for this next test? Get that done. And then the next thing, I'm not talking about go hang out with your boyfriend and go out to lunch and you know, like where you know you're not gonna wanna come back because you wanna be with your boo, don't do that. But I'm saying like, do something. 30 minutes of sex in the city or, you know, insecure or whatever. So I can just have that break and get that energy. Like my creative juices rolling and now I got to get back to the end of the zone. So that would be my recommendation. So before I say this, are you into the new sex in the city? You think it's good? Uh oh, uh, I haven't been able to watch, um, what we didn't have, what is it? It's on what now? I forgot. HBO. I don't have HBO. HBO so HBO. so I had to watch it at someone's house that did my, okay. my our oldest sister. So I was only able to watch it to a certain point. So long story short, I haven't really been able to watch it like I want to. They have some amazing art in there, by the way. 
Okay. Um, so to, to your question, I'm just keeping real, right? So first, first off, I live to get in the zone, right? So once I'm there, I'm trying to knock everything out. Like seriously, I'm just have a cup of coffee and boom, gone. And in terms of getting things done, like to keep it real, like whoever's paying me first is gonna get their work done first. Well, right? <laughs> so if somebody's telling me like, well, you know, we'll see, I'll talk, you know, the, we are entrepreneurs, right? So like, it's about getting paper, you know, at the end of the day, again, we're making an impact and all these things, <laughs> but we wanna get paid too. So whoever's paying me first is, you know, I, I put it in order like that, so. Uh, nice. And at the same time, like I said, just even getting back to the zone, I think, and I don't know about you guys, that's where I get my most, most of my work done. And it feels good to come out of it and look at what you've been able to complete, so. That's exactly right. And I wanted to elevate what you were saying about the block schedule. Um, so for those who, or I'll, I'll explain my understanding of it, um, is literally taking your Google Calendar or your Outlook Calendar or whatever you use, and marking off times of designated areas of focus. Yes. And what you mentioned just now was, yes, take time to play with your cat, your dog. You don't have to anyway. So why not also put that, embed that within your block schedule so that if someone, if you're co-collaborating with someone and they need your time, that time is already blocked off on your calendar so you can release the burden of saying yes to things that maybe will diminish your your progress. Um, so yeah, I just want to shout out block schedule. I use it. You know. that, that is that's a powerful tool because I do that too. Because I yeah. at twelve I know that's my thought work. That's how I have it blocked off in, in my uh, schedule. Yeah. Might be lunchtime, but that's yeah. thought work. Too. <laughs> you think, you know? Um, well, I just wanted to offer um, lend the floor for someone else for another question. We have another another taker. We have a virtual. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, I would love to. Um, I feel like I grew up kind of in this area. Uh, I went to Hales Franciscan. I don't know if Hales Franciscan is considered in the Bronzeville area, but that's where I went to. It's an all boys uh, Catholic school. That's where I went to high school. I had my ring ceremony on King Drive. Um, I can't remember the name of the church, but it's right. It's on King Drive over here. Um, and also the Bud Billiken Parade. Um, it's, that's that's my greatest memory, just going to that for the first time. And uh, did anybody go to the Chosen Few last week, last weekend? Nobody went to, oh my God, do not put this online. But yeah, don't put this online. But 40,000 40, people were there, right? <laughs> so um, one of the Chosen Few DJs is uh, Terry Hunter. And we actually were part, while we were in high school, we were part of an organization called Kudos that met on 51st in Michigan, which is in Bronzeville. And like I said, I just feel like I had a lot of formative years here in this area. And it's so rich with culture and Bernard, just what you've been able to do with Boxville and the presence that it has in the community, how you're able to maintain it, it's just amazing. So yeah, I love, I love Bronzeville. For me, it would have to be when um, I, I was talking to my, I talk to my parents, my parents are my best friends, my sisters are my best friends. So I talked to my parents a lot and my dad was, I think he was, I, yeah, it definitely came from him. He was very instrumental in saying, you know, like you should be documenting what's going on with the pandemic and all the riots and the injustice that was going on. Um, and so 2020, so during all that time, he's like documenting everything cause you know, this, this is history and like you do, you're a photographer, like, do what you can, obviously, and be safe. So when the protesting, the peaceful protesting that happened in Bronzeville, um, my sister and I, we went out there and we walked and we 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 walked, we were in unity with our community, and it was one of the most powerful experiences I have ever been a part of. And I and I'm not saying this at all to exalt myself because I. Believe me, I'm not at all. I, I struggle just like even with what you were saying about like seeing your work after 20 and you're like, oh wow, I really did a good job. Like a lot of times when I see my work, my photography, or I watch an interview that I've done or anything, I'm kind of, I'm very 
I'm a perfectionist and I'm very critical of myself, but I took some incredible pictures, incredible photos of what happened. And I'm just like, I mean, I had people hit me up like, this is gonna, this could be in Time Magazine at some point. And just, so to capture that and to be able to have been a part of it in a way where I was, we, we were active, but then also being able to document it from our perspective. Then I'm like, my sister and I are, you know, we're walking to everyone. I look over to my left and Kanye West is just like standing next to me. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like, uh, okay. And it's like, I have, and I have a picture and my sister took a picture of me taking a picture like on the slide of him, but I have photos of Kanye West and, and it's just like, I'm standing like, he's literally like, I can reach out and touch him. And I'm just like, whoa, like I know what I'm here for, but I'm also fanning out a little bit too, because yeah. I'm like, it's crazy. So it was, um, it was a really special, special time for me in Bronzeville, just going around and capturing what was going on in the community during such an important time in history for us all. Um, definitely got a shout out to the uh, Bud Billigan Parade. Uh, grew up with that. That was a big thing in our household, but also the Southside Community Arts Center. Um, as a young artist, um, it meant everything. I mean, that's where I met people like Bill Walker. Um, through the Black theater experience, you know, meeting musicians and poets and playwrights and directors and lighting designers and everything I learned about working collaboratively, I learned in the South Side, in Bronzeville, in these arts institutions. So I owe it all to, to places such as the South Side Community Arts Center. Have you been recently? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank y'all for that. Um, did y'all have questions for each other? While we, while we await potentially another question from the audience. I, I have a question for Akisha. Okay. Wait. Should I sit down? I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Should I sit no. down? No. Yeah. Yeah. Sit down. Yeah. You okay. Sit down. Okay. What? What has been your most memorable experience here in Chicago? She got to flip through her memory book. Is this like a personal one or no, like a let's business say one? Business, a business one. Oh, okay, I have one. Besides me, Kanye, yeah, no Kanye. Kind of. Yeah, that's on the list. But <laughs> um, yeah, I have one. So, you know, I was just looking a few years back. I don't even remember what year it was on the top of my head. I'm terrible with time. It was around Taste of Chicago. And this is relevant to Taste of Chicago, just passed. It's over, no, it's still going on. It's done? Okay. I heard the lines were really I know, I saw that video, crazy. <laughs> so, Tasty Chicago was in Chicago, obviously, um, and I was looking at the, the list of the roster of performers, right? And so I see the Roots are performing. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna shoot my shot. It's not yeah, gonna happen. Sure. It's, not gonna, it's not gonna happen, but you know what I mean? Like, what do I have to lose? I mean, you know. There's no pressure from anybody, right? So I go on Twitter and I'm like, let me just go to the head now. Let me just let me just send a message to Black Thought and just, you know, hey, introduce myself. And you know, my name is Akisha Lockhart. I'm a Chicago-based journalist. I'm an independent media outlet owner. And you all are coming to Chicago. Is there any way possible I can interview you all? So I send it. And, you know, I mean, what are the chances? He wasn't, I don't even think he was following me on Twitter. So, but it, you know, whatever. So he responds to the tweet, messages me back, says yes. And that has been my the homie ever since. And like, it was ridiculous. So I end up interviewing him. Did I interview? I think I've only interviewed him once, but I mean, he's like I said, like genuinely like, that's the homie. Like went to New York recently, met up, like did a street, um, photo shoot like randomly with him on a street in New York. 
went to go see his play. He did this, he worked on this wonderful play, Black No More. It's incredible. If you all have not seen it or heard of it, check it out. But um, that was like one of the most memorable, memorable things. And then for him to even to say like, we're at a point now where he's like, if I come to Chicago or anywhere near Chicago, like I can't come here without hitting you up. Like, it's like, if you don't stop, yeah, like no. if you are a legend, like would you stop? Like, and it's, and it's so like love and like a cool thing. You can tell like, he's a legend, but it's, he's such a human. Like, I don't a genuine even think, human being. yeah, like, do you understand? Like, I'm even talking to him, like, like, I don't think legends are supposed to be like, you know what I'm like? Legends respect legends. I'm just saying. Well, no, no, Bro. thank you. Bro. Thank you. I feel that. But no, I'm saying like, like being around him, I'm saying he's so down to earth where it's like, you're not a diva. Like, you're not like, you're like a real person. Like, you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. And you think about his resume and what, you know, what he's done and the impact he's had on not just hip hop, but the culture period. So to have that, I think for me, it just, it, it was a lesson learned in that never get in your own way. Like right. send the DM, send a message or whatever. What's the worst that can happen when they're not gonna respond? And then like send him more. And after that, I'm like, let me get up Drake. But, but you know what right, I'm hearing too. Anyway. You know what I'm, if you get Drake, shots to the girl. Um, but you know what I'm hearing too though, is that you, Shot, shoot, 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 shot, 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 shot. So that's step one. But then also a component of that is knowing your ask and how to position it. You had a very, it's not like you had a very intentional ask. And you also, you know, you had confidence in how you embarked on that situation. So it's like, oh, well, this person knows what they want. They're asking me for something they know where I'm, they know I'm going to be. This is what they offer. This is you know, how we can collaborate. And so I do you think that that also helps shoot, shooting your shot be successful? You having you say it back to me, it sounds like really like I had it together. I didn't feel like that when I was <laughs> I mean, I've sent that message like in, it's my template at this point. Hey, you there. I mean, I answered, oh. hey, I was a taste in Chicago. Well, you'll be in town for, you know, chosen few. And I'm a, like, that's my template at this point. So, and when I sent it, again, I think the thing that helped me, I don't think it's that I was great and all that, time and all that, but thank you for that. It was just that I didn't think he was gonna respond. Sure. There was no pressure because I'm like, he's not gonna respond. So I'm gonna do it just so in my mind, it's not like, well, Keisha, you didn't try because you did try, but it was no, no, like there was no boss that I was reporting to that was like, you have to reach out. It was me that came up with this whole idea. So I'm like, it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. And then it did happen. So then now in my mind, I have this thing where it's like, don't ever think it can't happen because you're the only one that's gonna stop it from not happening. Right, and it takes, it does take a level of gumption and audacity to even take <laughs> that step, so. Well, thank you. Make it happen. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Because I have a list for, for folks I would like to offer as well. So the first Drake though. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, no, no, I have, I have a list. Okay, okay. We'll, I we'll talk you. about it later. Okay. Uh, um, but Dory, did you have anything? Oh, question. Um, I don't see that. <laughs> oh, okay, that's fine. We can open it back up to the floor. Um, Akisha, did you have a question for any? Mm -hmm. Not yet, but yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, we would love to hear from you. Microphone, microphone. Let me put the mic please. Run you the microphone. Yeah. It's like Donna here. <laughs> First of all, I'm really enjoying this experience, so thank you to everyone thank that made you, it possible. You. Thank you. Um, as artists, as entrepreneurs, I'm sure you have had experiences that come across the table that require you to have to partner up, collaborate, work with other people, other entities, other groups, other organizations. Um, my question to you is, in those experiences, what have been the lessons that have come out of that? Specifically, the maybe the hardest lessons and the greatest lessons that you make sure you carry with you throughout everything else you do now. I have some. I'm just gonna be real simple. So whenever you're part of these collaborations and these group projects and everything, I think the main thing to be very mindful of is to do what you do very well, right? Uh, and represent yourself at, at the highest level. And try not, I mean, 
the thing about groups is that sometimes you have to take on other duties and, and those type of things, and that's okay. I think you should be open-minded for that. But I think being the highest representation of who you are is what matters most. I think, uh, I, I just actually had this happen yesterday, and um, I'm, a, I'm a part of a team, which is an amazing team. I love them so much. And I presented like my idea, an idea to them to help this project that we're all working on. And it was kind of like, it wasn't like a wa it wash, but in like some ways I kind of was feeling like, you guys don't see it like I, like I wanted you to see it. And I, I you know, wrote out an outline of how this was supposed to look. And in my mind, I can see it, but they were asking me some questions and it's like, but it's right there, like you can't see it. And so I think the thing that's really important is that when you are working, collaborating with other people, as hard as it is to not take things personal, like you can't take it personal and do your best. But if everyone doesn't ride along and give you an add a girl or it doesn't end up being what everyone goes with, like you got to move on. Like you have to have, and that's the thing I absolutely love. I worked in sports for a very long time and I'm an athlete just by like out the womb, like what I do, like that's just who I am because that's what I come from, is athletes. So the thing that I love about sports is that if a quarterback throws a pick six where he throws the ball and he thinks he's throwing it to the person on his team and the other team intercepts and they run it back for a touchdown, which is what you don't want to happen. If they do that, as that quarterback, you need to have an, like a um, you need to have a short what is it called short memory, but it's another word for it. Like not amnesia, it's 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 something. But yeah, you need to you need to forget about that real quick because you have to get back on the field and you have to keep playing. The game is not over. So if you're tripping as the quarterback when you get back on the field about throwing that pick six, six, you're gonna you're gonna mess up again because you're like. Oh my goodness, you're nervous, you're not playing free, you're not confident about what you're doing. So short-term memory, like you have to be able to let it go, even though you're like, not, and it's not to my team, if you all are watching, I love you, like I'm coming back to you all. But you know how Remy Ma has that, are you dumb? Like, you, you may feel like that, I don't feel like that, I didn't feel like that yesterday, but you may be working with some people like, you should see the vision, like you can't see that's the bomb, and it's like, don't have that arrogance about yourself. Like you did your work, you put it out there, they didn't like, okay, cool. Let's see what you guys are doing. Let's see what you all did. And if you have to walk away for a minute and come back, like do that, but just don't take it so personal. I know that was a lot. So I always think, okay. I always use theater as my metaphor. And um, I think, because I've done, I've worked in collaborative groups forever and I love them that you know, I think that you can really achieve very high uh, goals when you're working collectively. But my advice, number one, leave your ego at the door. Yes. Number two, establish roles. Mm -hmm. Again, if I'm thinking of, if I'm using theater as a metaphor, somebody's gotta be the director, okay? Somebody's gotta be the lighting designer. So people have to know their roles, how they fit in, but at the end of the day, you have to be working for the story, mm -hmm. whatever that is. Yeah. It's not about the director, it's not about the light, it's about the story. It's not about you. You have come together to tell this story, be it a play, be it a mural, whatever it is. And so I find that that really resolves a lot of ego issues because sometimes people just, they, they can't put humble themselves enough to listen. They always want to be the one telling everybody right. what to do. And so you have to also practice that listening, giving people mm -hmm. space, acknowledging that space, and then riffing off of each other. You know, I may have a half-baked idea, but by sharing it, it may spark a whole amazing idea out of you. Right. So I think the idea of also being confident enough to share what your ideas are and your thoughts to challenge each other, it's not a, it's not a bad thing. But you have to do it always looking at what is it, how can we tell this story the best and bring your best to the table always. Thank you for that question. 
Well, y'all, um, we're about a couple minutes to closing here, and I wanted to have our wonderful panelists express to us where they can be found, if they have any upcoming engagement, activities, events that we can plug into that y'all want to plug for us. Um, want to hear about them now. Well, I'm busy, 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 busy these days. <laughs> All on 79th Street. Um, if you guys want to come out and visit, my team and I, we are painting a big mural on 79th and Racine. We're going to be there uh, through um, probably early August, at least the next four or five weeks. Um, also been uh, working as an artist liaison with the pop court that's coming up. If you don't know about that, on 79th and State, uh, Chad and Great Initiative got a huge grant from the city to put up this pop court, which is going to offer entertainment, food, blah, blah, blah. I brought a lot of amazing artists to the table. Bernard Williams is doing a sculpture for the, for the uh, pop court. Um, Norman T is doing a lot of designing of the um, uh, seating and fencing. We've got Jill Griffin uh, doing a beautiful bronze sculpture, life-size sculpture of Mahalia Jackson. And then I also bring a lot of young artists with me along with that too. Um, but we will be outside sweating and um, racing if you guys want to come by and visit. And then I'm on IG, my name, Dorian Sylvain. Um, and then right now I've got a new one uh, called I Am Arbor Gresham because I'm working as an artist in residence this year. Well, actually since last year and this year uh, through the Invest Southwest. So, um, so we've got that website up kind of just highlighting and celebrating people of Arbor Gresham and the, the mural work that we're doing over this summer. Good. Yes, and what's your Instagram handle? There we go. Yeah. 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 Sorry. It is. <laughs> so speaking of that, you can find me at precise underscore CHI. That's precise underscore CHI on Instagram. I'll be hosting the Bantu Fest on Midway Playsauce on July 23rd and 24th. Basically all of July I'm outside. But outside. This week is uh this weekend is yeah. what? Um, the Silver Room Block Party. Yes, it is. I'll be covering that. And also Pitchfork is happening over at Union Park. So I'll be covering that. And the Roots are here, right? Yeah. Yeah, the Roots are here. So, um, you know, maybe uh, he should let me meet the legend. See what happens. Yeah. Shoot but the yeah. shot. Shoot the shot. Yeah, but see. That's all I'm going to say, right? She got a show. He's going to be like, who? Right. <laughs> she was lying. Right. Lying. Yeah, see, see, there you go. But um, yeah, that's that's what I have going on. Again, follow me at precise underscore chi. Let's build. Um, I love talking to business owners. I love talking to artists. I cover mostly music and culture. Uh, that's a lot of those are a lot of the topics and, and art also. So I love talking to all of you. So make sure you reach out to me. Thank you so much for this, by the way. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was a pleasure. 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 So again, I'm still a student, I'm still learning and growing myself. So I'm very humbled to even be, again, have a seat with these amazing people and with you all. So thank you for having me. I go by She's Got a Show. She's Got a Show on Instagram. I have a ski mask in my thumbnail. So if you're like, is that whatever? But yeah, and it's Keisha Lockhart. Um, so that's my picture. Um, as far as projects that I'm working on, I like to share those things on social media. So if you follow me, you can get all that, all the tea, all the exclusive and all that. Um, I share that there. And then uh, I'm trying to think, is there? Yeah, I'm heavy on IG. So Twitter, I'm not so much on there like I was before Facebook. I mean, I do it because I kind of need to, but I really don't enjoy it that much. So basically the best place is Instagram for me. So yeah, thank you for having me. And, if we do have a breakout session or something afterwards, um, I would love to actually meet you all in person. I can show you, you know, some of my work or whatever. Um, I have a business page too, all I need is one mic. That's in my bio, which is important. Um, my personal one, and there you can see all my photography. Well, the majority of my photography is on my business page. So the protest pictures, some of the celebrity pictures, 
um, cute fucking pictures. Love, Love puppies. Hey, hey. And, and entrepreneurship. And so with that closing, I just want to thank everyone again. Thank you, Bill Bronzeville. Thank you, Bronzeville Incubator. Thank you for uh, Sinikia for helping us set this all up. Thank you to you know, our tech crew. Um, and we'll be back again next month. And so look forward to seeing you all out for episode two. Thank you, Nikki. You. Thank you, thank I'm you. I'm right here. It was me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Sure, thank you.